I have seen a few times recently some churches with the American flag on their stage and pastors with their American flag tie on. And while I for sure love the country that I live in, I thought it would be good to fly the flag to, would remind us of what kingdom we truly belong to and who our king is. Our God is king, amen? If you're joining us for the first time, welcome. We're in this series called Crashing the Party because we are in dark times politically in our world and in our nation. And it is time that the people of God really stand and learn what it is to walk with the Lamb of God and to be part of the kingdom of God. And that requires of me to push some of your buttons strongly. So are you ready to continue on in that today? Would you stand for the reading of the word? We're in Matthew chapter 10. This is where Jesus is sending out his disciples into the world. Are there any disciples of Jesus in the room today? So this is for us. He says in verse 16, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and be innocent or gentle as doves. Beware of men. They will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues. Or another way, they will slander you in their churches. Verse 18, and you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. When they deliver you over, don't be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say. For what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Father, we come to you today, and I ask that you would again release your Holy Spirit in power. We as your people need to be filled with your Holy Spirit that we would speak wisdom in this dark time in our world, that we would speak wisdom into the political turmoil we face, Lord. That we would speak wisdom out into a world filled with deception. Fill us, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. You can be seated. Last week we looked at how we need the Holy Spirit and our only hope in this time truly is the Holy Spirit. And that he would come and move in power in our nation again. Um, Today, the title of my message is, We Need Wisdom. We Need Wisdom. One of the chief topics in the Bible is wisdom. Who can attain wisdom and how is it obtained? Proverbs chapter 8 This is wisdom personified speaking, and what wisdom says, verse 15, is by me kings reign, and rulers decree what is just. By me princes rule, and nobles govern justly. I love those who love me, and those who seek me diligently find me. Riches and honor are with me, enduring wealth and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold, even fine gold, and my yield better than choice silver. We need wisdom. We need to be people who speak the wisdom of God to those in authority over us. We need to be filled with the Spirit so we speak the wisdom of God to the world that we live in. Our nation has a severe deficit of wisdom right now. And <clears throat> there is foolishness in our world, but there is something even more dangerous 
than foolishness. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 12 says this, Do you see a man who is wise in his own eyes? There's more hope for a fool. Better to be a fool than to be wise in your own eyes. And what I see in the world are many, many, many people who are wise in their own eyes. Many people who know everything and have attained their own wisdom. And even in the church, maybe especially in the church, have turned away from the wisdom of God and the wisdom that only comes from God. We are facing many challenging, dangerous, and complex issues in our world. It will require wisdom from heaven. We're facing issues of immigration in our country. Newsflash. And I look and I see one side and one group of people is saying, open up the borders, let everybody in in the name of love and help. And I see another side and another group of people saying, they're all rapists, they're all thieves, they're all murderers, close it down. Can I tell you, neither of those is wisdom. Not wisdom from the divine, not wisdom from above. Are they all rapists, murderers, and thieves? No. Some of them genuinely need help and are seeking asylum and are dying in their countries and need aid. And as God's people, we should be the first to be trying to provide that. But here's the thing. Are some of them dangerous? Yes. And so we need to recognize opening everything up or shutting everything down, that is not wisdom. It's more complex than that. I would suggest it's more complex than humans are going to be able to figure out. We need help from above. We need the wisdom of God. And we are the people of God the ones who have access to it, we are going to have to step up and call out and say we need wisdom. We need to help and aid people. We need to look at the complexity of going, what's going on. We need to recognize as a nation we only have so many resources. We have our people here. And so we need to love them as well. And we need to take head on challenging issues complex issues and navigate them well. To do that, we will have to have wisdom. There are great <clears throat> issues and things thrown in our face all of the time about the LGBTQ plus community. It's just out there over and over and over again. And let's bring it to the church world for a moment because <clears throat> some people are going, well, what are you going to do? What are you going to let, um, what, what are we going to do when, if transgender people are here? Are they going to be able to serve? What are they going to be able to do? And there are churches that are saying, well, they're just welcome and able to welcome in every way, can do everything, can be involved in everything. There's others that say, no, they're totally out. And, you know, a Bible scholar named Preston Sprinkle, he says this, and this is so helpful. He says, if you have met a transgender person, you've met one transgender person. That's all you have. Because here is the truth. <clears throat> um, some people who struggle with transgenderism struggle with it and struggle with their gender identity because they were abused and molested as a child. They don't like it about themselves. They want to turn from it and follow God's direction in ways. They recognize it's not the best God has for them, but they struggle. Anybody in here struggle with anything? They struggle. There are people that have genuine um, imbalances 
in their body that causes them to struggle with that. They don't like it, they don't want to accept it, but they struggle. And they do not align themselves with the um, LGBTQ agenda out there that we see on TV, that we feel pressured with, but they just simply struggle. It is also true that there simply are just perverted men out in the world that want to dress as women so that they can go into the bathrooms. That exists as well. And so to navigate that and to say we want people, uh, transgender people to be saved, redeemed, but also we are going to keep children safe and we're not going to allow predators to run wild. Listen, that takes wisdom. And so people come and they say, what are you going to do? What are they going to be able to do? I say, I don't know yet, but I can guarantee you this. With that person, that one person, it will be walked out in wisdom. And it's not wisdom to say, well, they just can't do anything. They're not part of us. Nor is it wisdom to say, it's open reign for everything. And that's what churches are doing. And that is not what we're called to do. We're called to enter the difficult, challenging waters of wisdom. How y'all doing? <clears throat> Cynicism is not wisdom. It's fake wisdom. It looks like wisdom. It isn't. It looks like truth. It isn't. True wisdom always increases faith. Cynicism decreases our faith. It gives us no faith that we will actually move forward, that God can and will help us navigate these issues. Wisdom increases our faith. James chapter 1 verse 5. Do any of you need wisdom? Ask God for it. He is generous and enjoys giving to everyone. So he will give you wisdom. And here's the part, verse 6. But when you ask, you must believe. Don't doubt him. See, wisdom and faith go together. True wisdom creates more faith, not less. How y'all doing? It is time that God's people stand and engage and speak wisdom even politically. We've gotten really comfortable with separating our faith from our political lives. That can be argued very simply with this question. Let me ask you. Do you think what people believe affects their politics? It profoundly affects their politics. Because what we believe and our faith affects every area of our life. And politics, like it or not, uncomfortable with it or not, is a significant area of our life. Jesus did not come so that we could retreat and separate from the political words, worlds that we find ourselves in. Nor did he come so that we could overthrow them. But he came that the wisdom and truth of God might be presented to them. Jeremiah 29, 7. To God's people, seek the welfare of the land where I have sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. We are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. We are citizens of a different place. But at the same time, we do live, Christians live in nations. And the command given to us is, seek the good of the land where you're at. Even though you're exiles in that land, even though you're truly citizens of heaven, you need to seek the welfare of the land you are in. 
and pray for its benefit. This is the biblical foundation for Christian political thought. It's not about how we vote or what we post on social media. It's about what kind of citizens we become. Are God's people good, wise citizens in the land they live in? I cannot <clears throat> give you wisdom today outside of what is in the word of God. But Jesus tells us, as you are sent out into a hostile world, be wise. Be wise as serpents. Be gentle as doves. And so I can't give you wisdom today, but I can tell you how to obtain it. Is that good news? Proverbs 9, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. If you want wisdom, and if you want to be people who can walk in divine wisdom, you must walk in the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is what brings wisdom. Deuteronomy 10.12 says this, What does your God require of you? That you would fear him. What's required of us? That we would fear the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So let me give you a few points to help you be able to um, understand and be able to decipher if you're walking in the fear of the Lord or not. If we want wisdom, we must walk in the fear of the Lord. I want to help show you if you are walking in the fear of the Lord. The first thing that will show you where you're at with the fear of the Lord thing is how you relate to human authority. You guys are really quiet. First service was really quiet, and you may have them beat. How you relate to human authority will indicate how much fear of the Lord you actually walk in. This is not a song you sing. This is not just a prayer you pray. This can actually be shown by how you relate to human authority. This is hard for us as Americans because, what was the Latin phrase? Uh, vox populi, vos deo. The voice of the people is the voice of God. We are the authority. God doesn't see it that way. Romans 13.1, for example. Let every person be subject to governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. How much authority is out there that doesn't come from God? Zero. There is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. A great pushback on institutions in our day, isn't there? It's all instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear a sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Those authorities are in place to contain evil. That's their point. Therefore, one must be in subjection not only to God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed. First Peter 2. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. Whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil 
and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. That's in our political world. God puts authorities in place. The church world, Hebrews 13, 17. This is to the church. Obey your leaders. Submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy, not with groaning, for that's no advantage to you. 1 Timothy 5.17, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. Hello. <clears throat> and in the home, Ephesians 6, children obey your parents in the Lord. This is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first command with a promise that it will go well with you and you will live long in the land. How we relate to human authority shows how we relate to God's authority. Y'all aren't liking this message, are you? That's all right. I remember a time where I really, really did not like it either. My first full-time position On a church staff, I had to walk through this because I came in to that church staff and I was trained and qualified and I was called and I was anointed and I was a pastor and I was a pastor over a lot of things, worship pastor, youth pastor, associate pastor, every kind of pastor you could be except the main preaching pastor. And so I saw myself as his equal in authority. He did not see it that way. And I remember struggling, but I read a book called Spiritual Authority by Watchman Nee, and I would recommend you read that. I don't agree with every detailed theological um, conclusion he comes to, but I think the main message of that book is very important, and that is that God takes this authority thing really, really seriously. And so I had to step back and pray and walk through some stuff, and I really feel, felt God spoke to me and said, the way you interact with him is going to determine how far you go in life. Because it will show, this is me speaking now, it will show, and it, it showed how much fear of the Lord I actually had. Which in turn showed how much wisdom I would actually have access to. I can tell how much wisdom will come out of someone's mouth by how they engage and interact with me. Not saying they're bad people, not saying they're bad Christians. I'm just saying they won't have access to a certain level of wisdom because they're actually not walking in a fear of the Lord. How y'all doing? There have been people that have left this church because they had issues and they said nothing to me. At best, that is because they didn't understand and recognize how biblical authority works and how spiritual authority works. At worst, they have simply rejected it. This is not a message primarily about church authority. But it is kind of an in-your-face example, isn't it? 
Some of you have come to me with grievances and we've sat down and talked about them. And I want you to hear, whether you've left the, whether they stayed at the church or whether you're still here, I want you to know, I know that was uncomfortable. I know that wasn't fun. I probably didn't even like it myself, but that was pleasing to the Lord. You did the right thing. You honored and approached authority that isn't mine. God put it there. So I bless you in that and honor you in that. The Bible is very clear again and again in a bunch of different ways that God's creation works rightly and works correctly when it has wise God-fearing authority placed over it. This is Adam and Eve. Um, You know, if you were raised in a home with wise parents, that brings a certain level of flourishing to your life. That if you're raised in a home with unwise parents, you do not experience in that way. If you are in a church with an abusive leader and abusive authority, that will corrupt and damage your spiritual life. If you are in a church with wise leadership and loving, God-fearing leadership, you will flourish spiritually. And if you are in a nation that is being governed by wise rulers, that nation will flourish. And if the rulers will not receive the wisdom of heaven, that nation will deteriorate. This is God's design, that it would be governed by wise authorities. Now, of course, we live in a time where we have seen again and again the effects of of abusive authority and the temptation for authorities to abuse the power they have been given. And so that really brings us to point number two, to walk in the fear of the Lord and not the fear of men while you approach authority with respect and honor. doesn't matter if you think the president is qualified, capable, or not, whoever it becomes, you still approach the position with the appropriate honor and respect, recognizing God put them here. Even though we think we voted and so we put them there, the truth is God ordained it. And so you approach and interact in a certain way. At the same time, point number two, we have to be ready to speak God's truth and wisdom to power when it isn't convenient or culturally acceptable. That means being willing to speak up in wisdom and truth, stand up even when it costs us something, even when there's repercussions to that. This is the idea of the the prophet in the Bible. Prophets aren't just there to give you nice encouraging words, though that's awesome. They're not just there to uh, predict who's going to be elected, though they usually get that wrong anyway. Prophets are primarily there to stand up and be a voice against abusive powers and to call out, that is sinful, that is off base, that is out of line. And they also can praise righteousness, you're doing well here, you're doing good there. But they are to stand up and be the voice of truth in the world. I have watched recently as many, many, many big name prophets in our nation are willing to stand up boldly against political agendas. They they are willing to stand up boldly against the radical left and put it out there on YouTube and all over the place and write articles about it. But... When in the church it is revealed, there is great sexual abuse 
and spiritual abuse, severe things, not a mistake here and there. Sexual abuse of people that are of age and sexual abuse of people that are underage, I have watched those same prophets be unwilling to stand up against that. And what it has shown very clearly is that they will speak up and speak out when it's convenient for them. They will stand up and speak out when all of the Republicans will run to them and throw their money and support at them. But when they are also required, and I think it's good to speak up against the radical left, by the way. I think it's good to speak up to political power, by the way. But when it has also been required, speak up against these people that, at one, that you may have at one time called friends. Speak up against these people in the church and you are going to lose support. People are going to leave your church. They're going to leave your ministry. They will not do it. Do not listen to those people anymore. They are not walking in the true calling of a prophet which is to stand up against all abuses and misuses of power, politically and religiously. Until they repent, they are out of line. They are serving themselves. How y'all doing? <clears throat> There's great deception in our world, and there's great deception in the church. Anyone who leads you to give your allegiance to Jesus plus something else is by biblical definition a false prophet and a false teacher. Let me be clear, in our stream, there are many Prophets, pastors, teachers who are saying, give your allegiance to Jesus and Trump. That is a false teacher by biblical definition. If we peeked our head in the door of more mainline denominations, Presbyterians, Methodists, those places, many of the messages that we, you would be hearing are give your allegiance to Jesus and Kamala. That is by biblical definition false teaching. False teachers don't just teach you something that's inaccurate from time to time. That happens a lot. False teachers lead God's people to give their allegiance to Jesus plus something else. Be very careful. Be very, very careful. When you see the American flag flown on the stage and political figures exalted as a Messiah figure, You're in danger of taking the mark of the beast. It's that serious. <clears throat> Doesn't matter if you're on the right or the left. The beast is not partisan. The beast is behind both. Okay. I went off script there. I got to get back to where I was at. The... It is the job and the role of God's people to speak truth and wisdom to power. And we have released that to the public media. The media is the one who thinks they're the ones who are supposed to keep political power in check. They're the ones who's supposed to critique it. Um, on the Chicago Herald Tribune building, carved into the wall in stone, it says... Governments need, governments need critiquing, and we're going to give it to them. They've taken our role 
media thinks they are the ones who are to critique powers in the world. How is that going? It's because it's not their job. This is John 16. Jesus speaking about the Holy Spirit, when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. The Holy Spirit is the one who's, who comes into the world and says, no, that is sinful, and calls out good. That is righteousness, and calls out that, is le- that sin and that unrighteousness is going to lead to judgment from God. Where does the Holy Spirit reside? In us. It's the people who are filled by the Holy Spirit that are called to stand and speak up and call things out. That's sin. That's righteous. That's going to incur judgment. It's not the job of Fox News, MSNBC, social media sites. It's the job of God's people. The church has to reclaim that right if we have any hope. We have to reclaim the right to speak truth to power. We have to be able to say, whoever is elected, the minute we elect you, we're going to critique you. We are your loyal opposition. We're not against you. If it's Donald Trump, we're not against you. It reminds me of that story in Joshua when the angel of the Lord shows up. And Joshua was like, are you for or against us? You know what the angel says? No. (laughs) We need that word again today. God, are you for us? Are you for our party or are you against our party? No. You're called to be for him. We need to speak God's truth and wisdom to power. What that means, how do we do that? How do we engage in that way? Well, first of all, let me suggest to you, um, in our nation, it's really important that we vote. I'm not going to tell you how to vote. Please just unclench a little bit. (laughs) I'm not going to tell you how to vote. But in our nation, we are given an opportunity to engage and be involved. And we need to take that opportunity and be there as people who can speak God's wisdom to our world. You may be saying, well, I can't vote for either of these presidential uh, candidates. It's just messing with my conscience. I'm like, okay, fine. Vote for another candidate. Vote third party. I don't know. You know, I think it's clear we need some political reform some way. We probably could have found some better options out of the people. I think that's possible. Well, here's the thing. It's not going to, nothing's going to be reformed if God's people aren't out there actively engaged. So again, I'm not telling you how to vote. I'm just encouraging you to be the voice of wisdom in the world here. We need to be voting. Some of you need to get involved not in national politics, because that's kind of out of reach for most of us, but we need to be involved in our local politics. You have kids in schools, be a voice. When they have those meetings and those board meetings and all of that stuff, be a voice of wisdom there. As Jesus says, be gentle, don't be abrasive, don't be a nuisance, but be a voice of wisdom. Some of us need to get involved in what's going on in our county, our districts, our cities. We have opportunity to bring truth, and we have retreated from it. It's time again to step up and say, no, I'm going to engage in the world that I live in. Some of you are great writers. Some of you are very creative. Great speakers, great songwriters, all of this stuff God's saying, write again. Some of you just need to go and sit at your computer and write a blog, but a blog, not your opinion. We need more blogs and articles coming from the people of God that bring wisdom. 
from people who have sat and prayed and looked at the word of God and who are walking in the fear of the Lord and say, I'm going to write this and I don't care what people think, I'm going to put it out there because there's a lot of stuff out there on the internet, but there's not much wisdom out there on the internet. Write again. Put it out there. If you're a speaker or you're technologically gifted, make YouTube videos. Make a channel. Don't make it for the Republican Party or the Democratic Party. Make them for the party of the Lamb. The wisdom needs to go out there. It's time for us to step in to our calling. All right, last one. Are you guys doing okay? Number three, uh, the fear of the Lord really draws us to know when to be bold. Um, There are times God's people are to be bold, and there are times where they are not to be bold. Um, For example, I already hinted at this, there are many teachers out there who are going to uh, tell you that your pastor, hello again, is not bold because he will not tell you to vote for Trump. That's out there all over the place. And I am telling you, that is not one of the places where we are called to be bold. That is not knowing when to be bold. And so I want to present to you the places where the early church was bold to show you these are places where we need to be bold and we are going to take a stand and there are other places where it is not wise to be bold. Instead, we are to follow the gentleness, compassion of Jesus. So here we go, five of them. This is what the early church in the first century did. These are the things they stood for. The first is a multicultural community. This is Galatians 3, 28. There's no slave, no free, no Jew, no Gentile, male, female. We're all together around the same table. There's no rich, no poor. All kinds of people from all kinds of walks of life around the same table. This was very strange in Roman society. You stuck with the people that were like you. And it is getting to be extremely strange in our society. We're expected to stick with the people who look like us, who think like us. But Christians have always stood boldly for the multicultural community. I, I, heard a, I read a story about a church who, um, in the aftermath of COVID, they decided to give finances to some surrounding churches to help them. And as they gave finances to their brothers and sisters, um, it was found out that many of the churches that they gave to were primarily black churches. And what happened was, there, many in their congregation went into an uproar and started slandering them, saying they were supporting BLM. And they endured great slander. This was at the height of the BLM movement, by the way. They endured great slander on social media. And they endured many, many people leaving. And they endured many, many people talking badly about them and their leadership and their church around their town. But you know what they had to do? They had to stand boldly and say, well, first of all, we're not supporting BLM. We're supporting our brothers and sisters in Christ who happen to be a different color. And they had to say, we don't care. Take your money, slander us, post it everywhere. We will not be moved on this in the midst of political turmoil. We have to stand boldly. The second thing that the early Christians stood for and were not moved on was care for the poor. Christians in the first century were generous and they gave extravagantly. Uh, They welcomed those who couldn't afford very much. One Roman emperor said, the Christians care not only for their poor, but for ours as well. Uh, The generosity of the early 
Christians had a major impact. And it spread throughout all of Roman society, and it eventually led to the church outlasting even the Roman Empire itself. The empire that the church existed in lasted for 1,000 years. The church has been here over 2,000 years, and spoiler alert from the Word of God, it's not going anywhere. His government's, governance knows no end. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. By the way, Rome lasted a thousand years. In America, we're in year 248. So, just to give you some perspective. We have allowed and even <clears throat> encouraged sometimes the government to figure out how to take care of the poor. That is not their job. Governments are there, as Romans 13 told us, to keep order and provide protection for people and pay the bills of the country. That's about it. We have relinquished over and over and over again our responsibility. God's people throughout, his, throughout history since the church was born have led the way in caring for the poor. But now we're debating what best policies and systems for the government to have to do that. No. No. It's our responsibility, and we have to stand boldly in that. Number three, the early church stood boldly for their sexual ethic in Rome. The early church held a very high bar for sex, marriage, and family. Now, Romans were extremely famous for being extravagant in their sexual lives, especially the men. The men were allowed and by law able to have sexual relations with whatever women they wanted, whatever men they wanted. It could be homosexual activity, heterosexual activity. It could be old men with young men, old, young men with old women. The men could be sexually promiscuous as they wanted. But in the midst of that, there was this little movement that said, no, sex is for marriage between one man and one woman that provides safety for children to be raised. This is God's design. And they suffered for that, but they would not move. They stood boldly for their sexual ethic. Number four, early Christians stood boldly in their pro-life position. Pro-life in general for everyone, but especially with children. Um, infant infanticide was common in Rome. Unwanted babies were left outside to die from exposure. This was fine. You don't want the baby, you can't take care of it, leave it outside. Most of the ones that were left were girls because they were not as valuable one Roman man in 1 BC wrote a letter to his pregnant wife and he said, if you give birth to a boy, let him live. If it is a girl, expose it. Abortion was frequent in Rome by brutal methods, but Christians were well known for scouring garbage heaps for discarded babies. In the midst of this society, again, where this is all accepted, all legal, all perfectly fine in everyone's eyes, the early Christians are roaming around scouring the garbage heap for discarded babies. The church confronted abortion, calling it out as destruction of life, and challenged the men, in this case, to take responsibility for the children they fathered. They put their money where their mouth is and they spearheaded adoption movements that embodied the loving embrace of their heavenly father. Said, we're not just going to talk about being adopted into the family of God. We're going to be people that actually actualize that for those who have been discarded and re rejected. We stand boldly along with the early Christians in that. 
Now, as you can see on the screen, I have highlighted that um, while I was talking, if you lean left politically, you were probably squirming a little bit while I was talking about number three and number four. If you lean right, you may have been squirming a little bit while I was talking about number one and number two. Uh, nobody likes number five. <laughs> that the early Christians stood boldness and forgiveness and love of one's enemy. Uh, what we need to understand is <clears throat> the Bible never says you're going to be friends with everybody. It actually says you're going to have enemies, but you don't have an enemy that you don't love. Do you all hear that? You're going to have enemies. But you cannot withdraw your love from your enemy. Early Christians were thrown to lions, burned at the stake by their rulers, all the while offering forgiveness and love to them in the same heart that Jesus had. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do as they hang him to a cross. Christians have never moved until recently in our nation, <laughs> on their position of forgiveness and love for their enemies. To follow the Lamb, we must stand boldly for these issues that the early church stood boldly for. Hello, Lord. And you can put the next slide up there. This is what the Lamb Party stands for. Um, worship team, you can head up this way. <clears throat> I realized um, after first service that some people may be looking at that and saying, oh, he is uh, trying to pander to both sides. Uh, the truth is, I am trying to poke the beast recognizing that both sides will probably get upset about it. Here's the truth. If you follow the lamb, you will get to be called woke and a fascist Christian nationalist at the same time. I've found that to be true in my own life. It's this weird place that you get to be called the worst thing that the far right can call you, which is woke, and you get to be called the worst thing that the far left can call you, which is a fascist Christian nationalist. Because here's the thing, um, in John chapter 15, Jesus says, the world hated me, and so they're going to hate you. Now we are in great danger in our world of Christians thinking that says, if you love me, the Democrats will hate you. Let me say that one more time. We think in our stream especially that Jesus said, if you follow me, the left will hate you. That's not what he said. He said, if you follow me, the world will hate you. Because if you belong to the world, it would love you. But you don't belong to the world. We belong to another. We belong to the Lamb. And it's super important now more than ever that we keep Christianity weird. It needs to be strange to people. It cannot be co-opted in to where you go, oh, you're voting for them, so we're, we're on the same page as Christianity. Oh, you're voting for them, so we're on the same page. No, Christianity's got to stay weird. We serve a strange king. He's different than any king. There's no one like him. He was a king born in a manger. Kings aren't born in mangers. Not our kind of kings. There's no one like him. Instead of going and dining with the rich and the famous, 
He had meals with the tax collectors and prostitutes. There's no one like this king that we serve. He snuck away from huge crowds that were screaming his name and applauding. He didn't run to them. He left them. There's no one like this king. He chose a cross as his inauguration ceremony. He chose a cross as his enthronement so that a bunch of rebellious traitors, that's you and me, Think about that. Our king was executed when we should have been executed for rebellion. When we should have been executed as traitors, our king was executed so that we could be brought back into his kingdom, so that we could be washed clean, so that our record as traitors could be abolished on that cross. There is no one like our King. Would you stand with me today? If you would lift your hands to heaven. God, we're asking for your Holy Spirit to fall on us again, that we would be filled with the wisdom from heaven Fill us with the fear of the Lord today, God. Our world needs wisdom, and it has to come through us, the people who fear our God. Come, Holy Spirit, fill us again. Fill us not that we would just have a unique experience. Fill us not that we would just feel something, but fill us that we would speak boldly and speak truth and speak wisdom to the world, fill us so that we would take up our position as God's people and engage and impact the world, that we would be the light in the darkness. Holy Spirit, come now. Lord, make us aware of who's in the room, that the fear of God would come, that we would recognize the most powerful being in existence is here. The King is here. The one who supplies every breath we take is here right now. Help us recognize so that we can walk in the fear of the Lord. There's no one like you, God. And we commit and give our faith and loyalty to the Lamb. No one but the Lamb that is seated on the throne. Open our eyes, God. Open our eyes to see the Lamb. And guide us to follow your ways, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.